Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. I'm Peter Gross, co-host of the original Wild Kingdom with Marlon Perkins and Jim Fowler. You know, when Wild Kingdom aired in the 1960s and 70s, many of the episodes documented wildlife research efforts. Marlon and Jim accompanied scientists all over the world to observe animals and their natural behaviors. Some of the techniques you'll see in tonight's episodes are no longer necessary by today's standards, but the work is still just as important. Wild Kingdom took viewers to the far corners of the world and cultivated an appreciation for animals and their habitats. Marlon and Jim showed us the importance of preserving the natural world, not just for animals, but for our very own quality of life. And that's good news for all of us in the Wild Kingdom. So sit back and enjoy Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom, right here on RFD TV. Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom is presented by Mutual of Omaha, people you can count on. In the early spring, the Arctic sea ice of northern Alaska is a hostile place, and scientists here have become concerned that man's encroachment may adversely affect the wildlife. Welcome to Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. We've just arrived for our rendezvous with the helicopter. We're about midway between two separate wildlife research programs, which wildlife reporter Peter Gross and I will observe today. We're on the coastal ice near our northernmost city, Barrow, Alaska. It's in the flaw zone, that area where immobile shore ice meets the moving polar pack ice that the wildlife studies are conducted. I'll take the snowmobile to where open water separates the shore fast ice from the drifting pack ice. There, I'll observe the scientific census of bowhead whales on their spring migration. Peter will travel by helicopter to the other research project that involves polar bears, the world's largest land carnivores and their principal prey, ring seals. Good luck, Pete, I'll see you later. Okay. It will be a short helicopter flight to a camp on the ice where a scientist uses a specially trained dog to sniff out ring seals hidden in the layers under the snow. We'll probably see polar bears on the way. It's about 40 degrees below zero, and this ice we're on, which is about five miles from shore, is six feet thick and supports the helicopter safely. Shortly after our takeoff, we've encountered a polar bear, part of the large population of these bears in the area. They are magnificent animals, and if man is to be successful in preventing their extinction, it is essential that the ring seals, their principal prey, are maintained at a healthy population level. With the visibility as good as it is today, we have no trouble in finding the research camp. In just a few moments, we'll be joining them. It's hard to believe that people can survive in this fragile camp on barren ice, so many miles from anything. Even harder to believe is the fact that air-breathing animals can survive beneath this mantle of ice. It's from this tent camp on the ice, we'll be moving out on snowmobiles under the leadership of the University of Alaska's research associate, Brendan Kelly. 
Working with me here in the on-ice studies of ring seals is my research assistant, Lori Quakenbush, who is a graduate student at the University of Alaska. One of our objectives is to capture ring seals in order to fit them with radio transmitters. With transmitters attached to the seals, we can follow their movements and monitor their use of layers. In order to do this, we first must locate the seals. We accomplish that with the able assistance of a four-legged helper. Our Labrador retriever, Lil, performs a vital service for us, which we are unable to do for ourselves. She has been trained to use her keen sense of smell to sniff out the seal's breathing holes and layers hidden under the snow. She's obviously ready to do her job, so let's head out. Until we get to the area of good seal habitat, the dog will ride in a protective shelter on the sled. On this initial outing, Lori will remain behind to prepare the telemetry equipment we'll be using later. This looks like a good place to let Lil out to begin searching for seals. If it weren't for her ability to sniff out the air holes used by the seals, our task would be infinitely more difficult. Even though it's bitterly cold, Lil won't need her jacket, since she'll soon be generating a lot of body heat. Though she loves riding on snowmobiles, when Brendan commands her to begin, she immediately starts sniffing the air. close behind until her keen nose detects the scent of a seal. The breeze is coming from our left, so when it brings a scent, she'll turn quickly into the wind to follow it. There! It looks like the cross breeze has brought the scent to Lil. She's turned into the wind to follow the airborne scent. found the source and immediately shows us where. <laughs> Brendan will use this long rod to probe in the area where Lil is digging so he can locate the exact position of the seal's breathing hole. As soon as he finds it, Lil knows her job is done for now. It's very important that she doesn't get chilled in this bitterly cold air. Now we'll use a shovel to clear the snow away from the mouth of the hole. Peter won't have to do very much digging since the windswept snow is shallow here. The seal's breathing hole that Lil found for us leads directly into the water. It is under the surface of the water that the snare will be set.
When the unsuspecting seal surfaces here to breathe, it enters this loop of plastic coated wire, which tightens as the animal moves. The water is bitterly cold, and hands put into it to set the snare begin to ache almost immediately. With the loop well positioned, the rope is rigged to the wooden anchor. The anchor is buried under the snow, and the seal, pulling straight down, can neither get free of the snare nor pull the anchor loose. We've finished here now, and probably none too soon for Lil. With the snare set in the hole, we can now move to where Lori is radio tracking seals. These seals were previously captured and fitted with radio transmitters before release. We'll return at regular intervals to check this snare until an animal is caught. The setting of snares is now finished for the day and Lil can now rest in her shelter. We have rendezvoused with Lori here, where she's been locating layers of radio-equipped seals released earlier. She'll join us to see if the snares have caught any other seals. The first snare we'll check on is not far from here. going because natural forces have cracked the sea ice and forced it upward into what are called pressure ridges like these which are more abundant here than where we were earlier today many seals have been caught in this area by Brendan it looks like we've lucked out again today now the operation becomes even more of a team effort since all hands are needed to pull the captive animal out. The first step is to clear away the entry to the hole. The hole is open enough now for our needs, but we have to be very careful that the animal does not bite us as we get it into the correct position to pull it out. The job becomes even more difficult as the seal digs in his strong front flippers in resistance to our pull. Just as it was designed to do, the snare closed about the seal's middle without harming the animal. It's a nice healthy male ring seal, weighing about 150 pounds. That's Lil. Something's wrong. There's only one thing that would set Lil off like that, and it's big trouble. She has detected a large female polar bear with two cubs. There could be very serious problems if the bear should decide to attack in order to protect her young. I'll restrain Lil while Brendan and Lori take the seal away. Fortunately for all of us today, this bear has decided to move on. Lil thinks the danger is all over. I'm not too sure about that, and all I want is to get us both away from here as quickly as possible. The 
bears seem to be moving away now, and that's a real relief. Because of the presence of the polar bear, Brendan and Lori have moved the seal to a place where they can safely attach a radio transmitter. I'll join them to release the animal. Lil really enjoys riding on a snowmobile, even if it tends to get somewhat bumpy. Now that we've joined the others, Lil seems perfectly content to get back into the comfort of her shelter on the sled. I'll move ahead to where Brendan's working. Polar bears may still be around, so Lori will keep watch. Peters arrived here at the release hole just in time. We've used glue to attach a transmitter that will fall off next summer when the seal molts. Meanwhile, we can locate the animals to study them as an index to the health of their population. Any changes could affect the survival of polar bears who depend upon seals for food. In short, our study of ring seals is extremely important since they are so vital to the whole natural balance existing here in the Arctic. The study of seal movements and their use of layers is progressing very well. It's time to join Jim Fowler, where a census of migrating bowhead whales is being conducted. An opening like this in the Arctic pack ice is called a lead, and here a distinct current flows. Bowhead whales travel along such leads during their annual migration. At this time, a census is taken, which we will observe from the edge of the ice. Peter Gross has joined me to have a look at how the bowhead census is made. The man leading the population study is wildlife biologist Craig George of the North Slope Borough Department of Wildlife Management. In his hand, he holds a device that has become vital to this project, a sensitive hydrophone which collects and transmits the vocal sounds made by the passing whales. The researcher uses the device by lowering it on its own waterproof wire until it is well below the ledge of ice where we stand. This antenna relays the whale sounds from the hydrophone to a nearby receiver. Peter will listen to the sounds in the acoustical shed where the transmitted whale calls are received and recorded while I head up this icy ridge overlooking the open water to join scientists counting whales that pass below this lofty observation post. Whales are not the only wildlife that the observers see. Often large flocks of seabirds, like these eider ducks, pass by. Among the skilled observers here is Mike Pelorts, presently watching the passage of a beluga whale in the lead. This graceful white whale averages about 13 feet in length and weighs as much as three quarters of a ton. Here in the acoustical shed, Gary Tabor is the expert. He's listening to the calls of belugas, which often travel with bowheads. Now, some walruses have moved in. They make a very peculiar underwater sound. They grow enormous ivory tusks, and large adults weigh up to 2,700 pounds.
There's our first sighting of a bowhead whale. Others are sure to follow. Now the observing team begins its important job, making an accurate visual count of each whale that passes. Bowheads are big, averaging 45 feet long and 45 tons. The whale calls are carefully recorded by Gary. The use of a theodolite allows an Eskimo scientist, Elaine Potkotuk, to take a reading on the exact position of the surfacing whales so that individuals are counted only once. When she's fixed the whale's position, she relays this information to Rick Yackley, another observer, who enters the data into a computer for later study. As they pass here, the bowheads make many different sounds, and scientists hope one day to be able to interpret these sounds. Accuracy is imperative. If the census here indicates that the bowhead population has changed, new conservation procedures might be necessary. The bowhead whale count will continue until the migration has passed. The conclusions reached by Craig George and his crew in this study will enable scientists to monitor the population and ensure the survival of these mighty mammals of the sea. In the frigid Arctic, so little is known about the marine environment that scientists are just now laboring to establish a baseline of knowledge. We must continue monitoring populations of the great bowhead whales, ring seals, and polar bears to detect ecological disruptions as soon as possible. Through research such as we've seen today, Mankind is gradually coming to understand that it really is possible to live in harmony with the multitude of marvelous animals that inhabit the wild kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, people you can count on, has presented Mutual of Omaha's Wild Kingdom. Mutual of Omaha, helping people find Medicare solutions for over 50 years. To learn more about plan options or how to protect your kingdom, contact us today. Mutual of Omaha, protect your kingdom.